Good morning, Prince. The men who organized and carried out the 1953 coup soon scattered. General Zahedi, the prime minister who replaced Mossadegh, pleased the Shah with his repressive campaign against nationalists and leftists. Before long, however, the two men had a falling out. Zahedi, like Mossadegh, was a strong figure who believed that prime ministers should be free to run their own governments. The ambitious Shah could not abide that. Just two years after the coup, he forced Zahedi from office and later sent him abroad as ambassador to the United Nations office in Geneva. He died there in 1963. Zahedi's son, Ardisher, whose quick wit and perfect English made him a valuable asset to the coup plotters, went on to a long and successful career. Although he was still in his mid-twenties when his father became prime minister, he quickly emerged as a highly influential figure, serving simultaneously as his father's closest advisor and as a chamberlain to the Shah. His influence did not diminish after his father's fall, and in 1957 he married the Shah's eldest daughter, Princess Shanaz. Wary of his growing power, the Shah sent him off to golden exile as ambassador to Great Britain, where those who knew of his role in the coup embraced him. Later, he returned to Tehran for a term as foreign minister and then became the ambassador to the United States. In that post, he defended the Shah to the bitter end. After the Islamic Revolution of 1979, he moved to a villa in Switzerland. He never admitted his role in the coup and even published a rambling article asserting that the CIA was not involved either. Mossadegh's fall was not due to any dirty tricks the CIA might, CIA might have played, he wrote. My father never had any meetings with CIA agents. Azadola Rashidian, whose subversive network of journalists, politicians, mullahs, and gang leaders was crucial to the success of Operation Ajax, prospered in the years that followed. He and his brothers remained in Tehran, and his business ventures flourished under the Shah's patronage. His home became a salon at which politicians and other influential figures spent many evenings discussing the nation's future. Several times the Shah used him as a secret emissary to foreign governments. In the mid-1960s, however, the Shah became uncomfortable with the presence in Tehran of such a sophisticated and well-connected figure, especially one who knew so many secrets. Rashidian sensed this and moved to his beloved England to live out his remaining years in comfort. Not everyone who helped stage the coup was lucky enough to live into retirement. One to whom the Shah was especially ungrateful was General Nasiri, the officer who led the first unsuccessful coup against Mossadegh, and who also played an important role in the one that succeeded. For years after Mossadegh's defeat, Nasiri served faithfully as a commander, as commander of the Imperial Guard. He did the Shah's bidding so willingly and discreetly that in 1965 he was placed in charge of the brutally repressive Savak. In that post, he did the Shah's dirtiest work without complaint for more than a decade. Enemies of the Shah accused him of horrific crimes. When they began their final drive to power in the late 1970s, the Shah sought to placate them by removing Nasiri from office. Later, claiming to be shocked at reports that Sabak had employed torturers, the Shah threw his old friend into prison. Soon after the 1979 revolution, Mullahs dispatched Nasiri to a firing squad. Tehran newspapers published photos of his bloody corpse. Mossadegh's loyal chief of staff, General Raihi, Raihi spent a year in prison after the coup and then returned to his original profession, engineering. After the 1979 revolution, he became minister of defense. He served for a few months until the tide of radicalism overwhelmed Mehdi Bazargan's government and then returned to the private de private life until his private death. Private life until his death several years later in Tehran. The Shah gave Shaban the brainless, the most famous leader of the mob that rampaged through Tehran during the fateful days of August 1953, a yellow Cadillac convertible. He became a familiar figure in the streets of Tehran, driving slowly around town with a pistol on each hip, ready to jump out and attack anyone who seemed pro Mossadegh or anti-Shah. Savak agents called on him from time to time when they wanted someone beaten or otherwise intimidated. After the Islamic Revolution, Shaban moved to Los Angeles and published a memoir denying that he had done much of what had done much of what Iranians had seen him do. Princess Ashraf, the Shah's strong-willed twin sister, became something of an international celebrity in the years after her brother returned to his throne. For a time, she served as chairman of the United Nations Human Rights Commission, where she defended his regime, regime against what she called unsubstantiated allegations of widespread tortures and killings by Sabak. By her own account, her life was unhappy, marked by three failed marriages and the shock of her son's murder in Paris after the Islamic Revolution, evidently at the hands of killers dispatched from Tehran. After the revolution, comforted by her share of the billions of dollars her family had spirited out of Iran over the years, 
that she took up residence in New York. In a memoir, she admitted that there had been such a thing as Operation Ajax, and even put its cost at one million dollars, but denied what other participants reported about her role. Monty Woodhouse, the British agent whose clandestine mission to Washington in January 1953 laid the groundwork for what was then called Operation Boot, returned after its success, and had a friendly chat with Ellen Dulles. That was a nice little egg you laid when you were here last time, Dulles told him. Woodhouse was later elevated to the peerage as Lord Tarrington. He became a conservative member of Parliament and the chief editor of Penguin Books. His great passion in light, later life was the history of Greece and Byzantium, about which he wrote extensively. He also wrote a memoir in which he spoke frankly about both his role in the Iran coup and the coup's aftermath. It is easy to see Operation Boot as the first step toward the Iranian catastrophe in 1979, Woodhouse conceded. What he did not foresee was that the Shah would gather new strength and use it so tyrannically, nor that the U.S. government and the Foreign Office would fail so abjectly to keep him on a reasonable course. At the time, we were simply relieved that a threat to British interests had been removed. Herbert Morrison, the British-born secretary whose belligerence helped set his country on a collision course with Iran, retired from politics in 1959 at the age of 71 and was named to a, and was named to a life peerage. In his later years, he seemed scarcely to remember the passion with which he had denounced Mossadegh and defended the Anglo-Iranian oil company. His autobiography includes detailed accounts of his role creating the National Fire Service and passing the road traffic in, of 1930, but he devoted less than a page to Iran. He asserted that he had favored sharp and forceful action against Mossadegh, but that Prime Minister Attlee refused to approve an invasion because it would take a lot of time and might therefore be a failure. Attlee wrote in his memoir that choosing Morrison as foreign secretary was the worst appointment I ever made. He never regretted his decision not to go to war in Iran. Such action would no doubt have been, have been taken in former times, but would, in the modern world, have outraged opinion at home and abroad, he wrote. In my view, the day has passed, when commercial undertakings from industrialized countries, having obtained some concession, can carry on their business without regard to the feelings of the people of the country in which they are operating. The Anglo-Iranian oil company showed a lack of sensitivity in not realizing this. Winston Churchill's biographers have paid almost no attention to his central role in the coup against Mossadegh. Most books about him do not even mention it. Churchill once said privately that he considered the coup to have been the finest operation since the end of the war, but he never considered it more than an obscure footnote to his career. The chief hero or villain of the piece, Kermit Roosevelt, went on to an oddly undistinguished career. On his way home from Tehran after the coup, he stopped in London and gave Churchill a private briefing. Young man, Churchill told him when he finished, if I had been but a few years younger, I would have left nothing better than to have served under your command in this great venture. A few days later, Roosevelt, Roosevelt repeating his brief, repeated his briefing at the White House for President Eisenhower, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and a small group of other senior officials. Soon afterward, at a secret ceremony, Eisenhower awarded him the National Security Medal. Roosevelt concluded his White House briefing by warning that the CIA should not take his success in Iran to mean that it could now overthrow governments at will. The Dulles brothers, however, took it to mean exactly that. They were already plotting to strike against the left-leaning regime in Guatemala and asked Roosevelt to lead their coup. He declined. In 1958, he left the CIA. After spending six years with Gulf Oil, he struck out on a series of moderately successful consulting and lobbying ventures. He died in 2000 still considering August 1953 to have been the highlight of his life. Until his dying day, he believed fervently that the coup he had engineered was right and necessary. Have a good day, friends.